Okay, um, so today we're going over thinning and then all next week we'll work on density management. Um, and <clears throat> remember, we're gonna do that lab asynchronously. And I have some videos up that'll give you the, the basic content of the lab, but remember the numbers in those videos and the numbers in the lab handout aren't correct yet. Um, I'll get those corrected either on tomorrow or, or Monday and then I'll update you all. So. so today what we wanted to do is an introduction to thinning. So thinning is completely an intermediate treatment. Um, it may impact later what you do with the clear cut. You may need to think about how you're gonna thin a stand when you establish the stand, but the thinning itself is always gonna be done in the middle of a rotation as an intermediate treatment. Uh, so today I wanted to focus mostly on the ecology, uh, maybe a little bit on the economics and operations. And so to get y'all started, uh, go ahead and you can work in groups and come up with the top five factors you want to consider when you decide on a planting density, if you're planting a lava like pine plantation, because again, that's going to play a role in what we do later in thinning. So take a few minutes and work on that. Let's go ahead and get one factor per group. So we can start in the back here and try not repeat a factor another group's done. So it'll be kind of challenging when we get to the front here. See so all in the back corner there, what you, what'd you get? So site quality, okay. And over here, had a few groups maybe. Landowner objective. Landowner objective. And uh, over here. Okay, distance to the mill, some markets. Okay, what product you're making. And then I think we have one more group up here. Okay, so yeah, the, the genetics you're gonna apply. So yeah, so those are all good factors that we've talked about. Um, so you're thinking about a lot of different things. Um, some of those were operational, some of those were economic, uh, some of those were ecological. And so uh, if you think back to the very second class, when we were reviewing stand dynamics, we sort of got at this question, right, about how many trees you plant per acre, um, which is among those other considerations you all were focused on. And so this was some simulated model data I uh, put together. This was done with PTAIDA. So those densities are approximate. They're not exactly what they were in each of those columns. But remember, those are the, the same five densities that we looked at that second day of class. And so I ran um, a, a two thinning rotation and then clear cut it. And I did this using some sort of realistic timing, but I also used uh, mean annual increment to sort of schedule this out. So you can see that the 200 trees per acre plantation included no second thin, just because it didn't make sense to second thin it at all. It didn't get anywhere near a, a high enough basal area you would think about thinning it again. But you can see, regardless of planting density, other than that extreme example of 200 trees per acre, um, you end up, based on SDI concepts that we're gonna go over next week, you end up targeting a thin at about age 12 or 13, you end up targeting a second thin at about age 20 or 22, and then you end up targeting a clear cut around age 28 to 30. Um, and so with this, this was on a site index 75 feet at 25 year site. So that gets to the, the group that came up with site index. So this is a relatively average site in East Texas. But look at the mean annual increments. Regardless of what your thinning regime is, regardless of what your planting density is, you've basically fully occupied that site. You can see it tapers off a little at 200 trees per acre because you may not have quite fully occupied that site. But with the rest of them, you pull off about five and a half merchantable tons per acre per year over this whole rotation. So from an MAI standpoint, you really can't tell which of these is best. But then, you know, one of you was saying, what products are you gonna make? That's where these rotations become very different. So this is the cumulative volume in tons per acre on the y-axis. There's your planting density on the x-axis. And so what you'll notice is that the blue bar at the bottom, that's saw timber, okay? The gray bar at the top is pulpwood and the orange bar in the middle is gonna be chip and saw. And so if you go with that 200 trees per acre on the far left, you end up with the most saw timber, the least pulpwood, the least chip and saw, on the far right at a thousand trees per acre, you end up with very little saw timber in 30 years. Um, almost the most pulp, but not quite, but the most chip and saw out there. You get all your trees into chip and saw size class. But you kind of have the sweet spots uh, there in the middle at 400 and 600 trees per acre where you have the greatest overall productivity. 
you're still producing uh, quite a bit of saw timber. So you can see 400 trees per acre, you're still producing about 77 tons per acre over the rotation of saw timber. So that's gonna be about three loads per acre of saw timber, um, but you've got more overall production. The other thing to think about, when is most of this pulp wood coming off these stands? You're harvesting it in the thinning. So that pulp wood, it's not a direct trade-off necessarily between the pulp wood and the saw timber, where that pulp wood was harvested earlier when that saw timber wasn't there yet. The saw timber sized trees didn't exist yet. So if you hadn't thinned at all, what you would have seen is you wouldn't have removed nearly as much pulp wood. You probably would have removed similar levels of saw timber because those pulp wood trees would have died out in the woods and fallen down due to density dependent mortality. And so it's not like you can directly swap out the pulpwood for saw timber there necessarily. So, so this is why when we look at planting densities, we're often targeting 400 to 600 trees per acre because it gives us the most overall production. And at the same time, it still produces a lot of good saw timber for us. So southwide planting density today is probably close to 500 trees per acre. But you can see it's, it's gone down over time. Um, so they've done a study, uh, forestry cost trends in the southern US um, Auburn University has been doing it since probably the 50s, I think. Um, and so they've released it for when you get to management plans. It's a really helpful document because it'll break down timber cruising, um, timber marking, mechanical site prep, chemical site prep, thinning operations. It, it breaks down all our different operations, prescribed burning, and it gives you prices per acre. And it's based on surveys that they give out to forestry operators and forest landowners and companies. Um, so it gives you rough prices, but th this is their planting density trends over time. And so what we used to do, you know, back in the 1960s, some of you, when we did the exercise last class, you were planting like 1200 trees per acre. That was a good 1960s prescription. We would plant a lot of trees per acre because we were kind of hedging our bets against mortality and because we didn't have the genetics that would help them self prune yet. But think back to about the fourth, fifth lecture where we compared seed trees to plantations and looked at that data, right? And you saw that you could plant more trees per acre in one of those treatments. And then I think it was about 1200 trees per acre. The next treatment was 680 trees per acre, but remember they came out with about the same level of productivity. So when you plant more trees per acre, what we find is you're planting trees that are just gonna die due to density dependent mortality. Um, or you'll have to remove them in an early thin for pulp wood. So planting too many trees per acre really just isn't worth our while, which is one reason the trends come down. Another reason the trends come down is we've got better nursery practices, better you know, understanding of all our silvicultural treatments. And so we're able to get better early survival, better early growth. And so you don't need to put as many trees out there. So the common argument I'll still hear today when people wanna plant high densities is, well, I think some of them are gonna die. So I'm gonna plant more than I need, right? Well, what tends to happen when you actually see this play out on the ground is, you know, if you, if you want 600 trees per acre, so you plant 800, you're like, now I can have 25% mortality and I'm good. What'll tend to happen is you may get 25% mortality, but most of it's in this, you know, corner of your stand. So you get areas, patches where there's a lot of mortality. Maybe the soils aren't right there. Uh, maybe it was an old log deck that you didn't rip up, you know, who knows? but you get a lot of mortality in certain areas within the stand. And then your other areas are left overstocked. You wanted 600 trees and now you have 800 in those areas because there was very little mortality. So mortality doesn't end up being, you know, every fourth tree if you have 25% mortality. It's not typically uniformly distributed throughout the stand. So the best thing you can do is figure out how many trees per acre you want for your first thin, your second thin, by the end of the rotation, plan your planting density on that um, and just, you know, get good seedlings, plant them well, do everything you think you need to, um, to get survival up. So, so that kind of links in a lot of what we've been doing to what we're talking about now in thinning. And so with thinning, really what you're doing, you're capturing mortality. So you're putting trees on a log truck that would otherwise die and fall down in the stand. That doesn't meet every landowner objective. If you're managing for wildlife and your taxa like dead trees standing or downed, you know, you, you don't have to thin, you can leave trees out there to die. So sometimes mortality is not a bad thing. Um, you have the opportunity to make your stand more resilient. And so if you thin a stand, you know, that's one of our best treatments for Southern pine beetle, right? In the South, uh, maintaining your stand at appropriate density 
helps each of those trees be healthier, higher vigor, and makes them more resistant and more resilient to a lot of different disturbances. Um, thinning can make your stand more resistant to impacts from either prescribed fire or wildfire. So there's lots of different good things thinning can do. What we're really doing from a timber management perspective in thinning beyond capturing mortality is we're reallocating growth in our forest. And so you're trying to grow the trees you leave better by providing them with more light, more water, more nutrients. And so what you tend to see, here's a graph where you see pine basal area from left to right, zero up to 140 square feet per acre. And this is the diameter growth in inches per year. So basal area is pretty closely correlated with volume. Generally, if you have a higher basal area, you're gonna have a higher volume. And here's the other thing that we're gonna see over and over again in thinning. When you remove trees, it is always gonna reduce basal area. And when you reduce basal area, generally you are gonna reduce overall growth of that stand for the rest of the rotation, okay? Unless it was a really light thinning that just managed to capture the trees that were about to die, you're gonna remove some trees that would have been growing in that stand for a longer period of time. So thinning almost always reduces the overall growth of your forest. But what it does is it allocates all those site resources to the trees you've left and it grows them much more rapidly. And so what you've been able to do hopefully is pull out the trees that are poorly formed, diseased, less desirable species. You've pulled out trees you didn't want in that stand. And so now all the growth in that stand, while it's less overall, is going to the trees that you want. So while you reduce overall growth, you can actually increase merchantable growth. Okay, um, so, so how does thinning affect stand density? Y'all did timber cruising at Field Station last weekend, right? Or a couple weekends ago? So what are the impacts of thinning on stand density? Not, this one's actually not a trick question. You cut trees down, it reduces density. So just keep this in mind as we get into these quantitative tools. Some of the quantitative tools we'll see next week are complex, they're visually complex. You know, they're graphs that have a lot of different things going on with them, but just keep in mind, you can't thin a stand without reducing trees per acre, and you can't thin a stand without reducing basal area. So that's pretty straightforward, hopefully pretty easy to understand. But once you get on these complex figures, you're drawing a line wondering, is that right? Well, then if you look at it, you'll realize, well, I thinned the stand and I reduced trees per acre, but somehow I added basal area, which makes no sense. You can't do that, right? And so when we look at the impacts of thinning on growth, Here's sort of an idea where when you look at that red bar going from the top left and angling down to the bottom right, diameter growth rates on trees can reduce over time in an even aged forest. So as a tree gets larger, it has a larger and larger and larger diameter, which means it has a larger and larger and larger circumference. So if it keeps growing the same amount of wood per year, that has to be a thinner and thinner and thinner growth rate because it's spread around a larger circle. So even if the growth rate, if it's putting on the same tons per acre per year of wood, you're gonna see smaller and smaller and smaller growth rings and your diameter growth rates are gonna decline, okay? Um, at the same time, we see that blue line angling from bottom left, sort of curving up to top right. What's the shape of that curve? We've seen that a few times. Yeah, that's gonna be kind of like a logistic growth curve where some sort of carrying capacity, right, is dictating the top there. And so as diameter increases, it, you know, it, it'll plateau at some point. This doesn't always happen. You may have situations in uneven aged forests where those diameter growth rates keep going up pretty steadily because you, know, you end up with very few trees that are really big, but you know, there's few of them per acre, they get lots of site resources. But here's the idea with thinning, you know, right there where the dotted lines branch off the solid lines, you did a thin. And so what you have is the opportunity to reduce the rate at which those diameter growth rates are declining, which can increase the diameter overall on the tree that you've left out there after a thin. So that's what you're trying to do with the thinning. Um, and how thinning's gonna work, it's gonna be, we're gonna get into this with, with fertilizer as well. You know, right after you go out and thin a stand, is there an immediate diameter growth response? So if you go out there a week after you've thinned a stand, are the trees much different? Not really, this is gonna take time to accumulate, right? So what happens is those trees are now getting more light in lower limbs on the crown, so they can start photosynthesizing more in those leaves. 
And then, you know, that helps them accumulate more sugar. They're getting more water, which means they can photosynthesize for longer periods, right? Um, because, you know, the stomata aren't closing in the midday heat. So they can photosynthesize maybe a little bit more. Um, they're getting more nutrients, which helps them build more proteins and other cell structures, which, you know, helps them photosynthesize more basically. And so as this goes on, what you see happen over a period of years, this is a lava like pine thin, thinned at age nine. And before the thin, you can see the thin trees happen to have slightly larger stem diameters already by less than half an inch than the unthinned trees. That was just random variation between the plots. But what you'll notice, you know, one year later, they start separating a little. They're about 1.3 inches in difference. But then two years after, you can see the response really kicking in where the thin plots have three inch larger, um, I said stem diameter, these are crown diameters. So the crowns are responding. And so you get the crowns expanding to fill in those gaps where you cut trees down. So as you leave the trees, you know, they'll add a few feet in crown width, that's more leaf area that can photosynthesize even more. At the same time, here's what happens. So here's this nine-year-old loblolly pine stand. So a nine-year-old loblolly pine stand already has live branches almost all the way to the ground. It has very few at the bottom that have had to self prune because they're too heavily shaded. So before the thin, they have a 70% live crown ratio. So if these trees are 30 feet tall, 70% of 30 is gonna be 21 feet. And so there's 21 feet of live crown at the top and then the bottom nine feet of the tree, the branches have died and they're in the process of self pruning. So that's our starting point. And then what happens in the unthin plots, the blue bars on the left, where you don't thin it, you end up with more and more lower branches being shaded out as these trees continue to grow. And so as the trees get taller, you end up with more clear bowl at the bottom where the branches have died and are self pruning. So by the time you get to five years after the thin, only half the total height of that tree has live leaves on the branches, okay? But look in the thin plot, it's up to 65%. So this is really good from a thinning perspective if you want a lot of live leaves on the tree to keep growing it, right? The downside is you've got more branches, they're not self pruning as much, you're gonna have some more knots. So not necessarily the perfect solution from a timber standpoint, but usually that's a very, very minor secondary thing we don't think about much. You're really focused on growing your trees larger. And so here's what all this looks like with your total yield. So there's cubic feet per acre, that could be tons per acre, no numbers on there, so it doesn't really matter. But you have that blue line at the very top, that's our logistic growth curve of how our stand is growing. And then you do a thin at the point where the dotted line breaks off of it. And so you see, sure enough, you've reduced total yield off that stand. You've reduced increment for the rest of the rotation because you cut some trees out of there, okay? But the hope is you do what happens on the bottom red line where your harvestable wood you know, goes up, you thin the stand and you get a reduction in the total amount of harvestable wood. But if you wait a few years, you get more growth on the really good trees and eventually that dotted line crosses over. And so by the time you come back out there to thin again or to clear cut, there's more merchantable material than they would, there would have been otherwise. So, so that, that's, that's kind of the hope with thinning. And all this data is really suggesting to you, don't put together a prescription where you thin the stand and you go back two years later and you thin the stand and you go back two years later and you thin the stand. You need to wait between thinning and your next harvest operation or you're not gonna capture the value of thinning. Yeah, Preston. Uh, on that merchantable portion there? Yeah, so what's happening there, when you thinned, you gave more site resources to the trees that can produce merchantable wood than you would have if you hadn't thinned. And so you're reallocating site resources to the merchantable trees. That's what you're doing with the thin. And so that, that, that's how it's able to cross over. Most of those merchantable trees you left out there, okay? And so a thinning will do very similar things uh, as if you fertilize the stand or you irrigated the stand. You can get similar growth responses because that's what you've done. It can do a very similar thing to what you would see with good competition control because it's the same idea. It's taking those site resources and allocating them to the trees you want and not other vegetation. So, so that's why it's crossing over. And here's where thinning really makes sense and why thinning really makes sense. You know, if a eight inch diameter tree 
and a 10 inch diameter tree were worth the same amount per ton, we might not be able to make as much value off our thins as we can. But because an eight inch tree might be chip and saw and a 10 inch tree might be saw timber, you have this stair step function for value. And so what you can do with thinnings is you can thin at a period where you're removing the lower value products. So probably pulpwood, maybe some chip and saw, but then that will accelerate your stand bumping up to where all a majority of your trees, not all, but a majority of your trees left bump up into those more valuable product classes. So as soon as you can get some small saw timber, your stand is suddenly worth a whole lot more. So thinning is going to get you there faster. And because it gets you there faster, then you can clear cut sooner and that clear cut will be more valuable. And so that, that's kind of the economic idea behind thinning. If this was just a linear trend up where, you know, for each 10th of an inch diameter of the tree add, it added one unit of volume. If it was a linear trend, we wouldn't see as much value in our thinnings. So, but a typical first thinning in a pine plantation, you may be bringing in $300 an acre of stumpage to the landowner. So the landowner may be making $300 an acre. Okay, so this applies to thinning, but we'll look at this again later this semester. This applies to any of our mid-rotation treatments, okay? So let's say we were thinking about doing a pre-commercial thin that we'll talk about in just a moment. So a pre-commercial thin means you cut trees down and you leave them out in the woods. Nothing goes on a log truck. And so you would do a pre-commercial thin early in a rotation before the trees are of merchantable size, but when you thought you really needed a thin to continue growing the stand that you've got well. Okay, so you think of a pre-commercial thin just like you think about fertilizer application, prescribed burning, or, or a mid-rotation application of herbicides, where it's an investment you're making in the stand in the middle of a rotation, and you're not immediately making money off of it. Okay, but what you can do, these, these numbers are percentages, and the percentages are a return on investment. So it's an economic number you can use to make decisions. And so these ROI numbers, you can think of them as sort of an interest rate that an investment is yielding. So the interest rate an investment is yielding. I think some of you had Dr. Conrad's personal finance class. Um, so you would have gotten into, you know, some similar numbers here. So in this table on the, the different rows, that treatment you do is going to yield a volume response. So you're going to get some sort of volume response here. I've got it in tons per acre per year. And then the different columns, you know, you're going to be harvesting products at different stumpage prices. Okay. So if we look at this in the context of product, look at that column on the far left. And let me explain kind of the shading. The shading doesn't show up very well up there, but you can look at the number ranges. So I put all the negative numbers in red. A negative return on investment means you're not making money on the treatment. Um, there are scenarios where we want to do treatments with a negative ROI, even if it never makes you money it may still be the best thing you can do on that stand because it may prevent total loss of the stand um, due to drought, fire, insects. So it still may be worth doing a treatment here or there that has a negative ROI. So it's not that you don't do it at all. But if, if you're thinking about a fertilizer application and you think you're going to get a negative ROI, there's absolutely no reason to do that application, right? Okay, so negative numbers are in red. The, the green numbers in the middle, they're between zero and about 3%. And so between zero and 3%, that's our average long-term inflation rate. Um, so, you know, inflation means that everything always gets slightly more expensive gradually over time. In the U.S. for the last, you know, 20, 30 years, we've had inflation rates of 2 or 3%. So basically, if you hit those ROIs, you're not making any money. You're staying even. Inflation eats up all your returns. Um, next are the yellow numbers, and those are between about 3 and 10%. And so when we look at the stock market over the last 70 plus years, the stock market has yielded a nine or 10% return on average. So if you're doing a treatment like that, you can make just as much money instead of spending money on that treatment, just go buy an index fund for the S&P 500 or you know, almost any index you want. And over time, you would expect it to yield about as much money. Um, those sort of grayish numbers on the, the bottom right there, those are numbers over 10%. That's where you're really making a lot of money on forestry and doing really well with those treatments. So as we look at this, now let's look at specific columns. If your pulpwood is yielding you stumpage of $5 a ton, that's got you all in that far left column, okay? So if you're going to be harvesting pulpwood, 
can you do treatments that yield you a good economic return? No, you really can't, right? And this is assuming your treatment's 150 bucks an acre. Um, this would all shift up and to the left as that treatment cost gets lower. So, you know, you can manipulate this based on the economic assumptions you make. But if you're managing for pulpwood, it doesn't matter what you do. You're not going to make money managing for pulpwood if it's going to be about $5 a ton stumpage. But then if we look towards the right, um, not the far right column, but the next to right column, that $25 a ton column, if you're managing for saw timber at $25 a ton, you can't do a treatment that's only yielding you 0.5 tons per acre for your additional growth. That gets you a negative ROI. But anything more than that, so even if you do a treatment at 150 bucks an acre mid-rotation and it gives you a small growth response, a ton or a ton and a half per acre per year, you know, you're not losing money. But anything over a ton and a half per acre per year, you're making a lot of money. So if you're doing these mid-rotation treatments and you're spending money on them, but you're getting saw timber back and you're getting saw timber back at 25 bucks a ton stumpage, you, you can make a good deal of money doing this, okay? Um, and so uh, another thing to look at this, you know, again, that opportunity when you bump a tree up from large chip and saw to small saw timber, or large pulp with small saw timber, all of a sudden you move from a column near the left to a column much further to the right. And so you have more options silviculturally. Um, so if you can bump your trees up into larger size classes, you can make more money with any of these treatments. So again, this doesn't just apply to thinning, but it's something to keep in mind as you get into management plans. If you have landowners that wanna make money on their forest and you're asking what treatments can we do, you're thinking about your economic analyses, you know, manage for high value products and you've got a shot at meeting their objective, manage for low value products and it's probably not gonna happen. So that's sort of a little on the theory of the, you know, operations economics and a little bit on the ecology of thinning. Uh, but now let, let's spend some time looking at the different types of thinning. And so we have two broad categories. We have pre-commercial and commercial thinning. Um, and honestly, you know, it, you could maybe under certain circumstances apply any of the commercial methods. Uh, but if you did it in a way where you weren't removing any trees, they could be pre-commercial. But most often those commercial methods, when you do them, you are removing trees. So they are going to be a commercial thinning. Um, the pre-commercial thinning options, the four I've lifted there, listed there, they have very specific definitions. And those specific definitions basically mean you're definitely not removing anything. So you're never going to see cleaning, liberating, weeding, any of that treated as a commercial operation. With timber stand improvement, occasionally you could do that and have it be commercial. Um, if you have a market for the trees that are less desirable that you are removing. So let's look at these different options. So with pre-commercial thinning, all thinnings are going to reduce stocking. Um, it doesn't yield any trees of commercial value. So usually you just cut the trees down and you leave them. Or you may not even cut them down. You may push them over with a bulldozer. You may have a hand crew out there hitting them with machetes. Um, you could accomplish some of this with herbicide through hack and squirt or other methods. So, you know, the specific tool you use to do this isn't specified in most of these directions. What's specified is what size trees are you cutting and what size trees are you freeing up to grow in your stand? That's how these definitions are set up. And so here's an example of a loblolly pine plantation in Arkansas that's in desperate need of a pre-commercial thing. You can see those trees are an inch or two in diameter. There's nothing out there that's yet able to go on a log truck, nothing of value out there. But imagine what happens if even a low intensity prescribed fire rolls into that stand, right? They're done, total loss. This is the type of stand where if you had a stand at a lower stocking right next to it and you had a severe drought, that stand at a lower stocking might be fine, but you might have every tree in this stand die, okay? If you get at these really, really high densities, you can actually stall out height growth rates at extremely high densities where each tree is just so low vigor that they just can't put on the height like they normally would. And there are circumstances where you can leave a stand severely overstocked for so long that it will no longer respond to thinning. If you get the live crown ratio on each tree in there below 20%, below 10%, so each of them just has a few little leaves at the top, they're barely hanging on, and then you thin them, they may not do anything. They may just sit there, you know, they may get hit by more sun than they're used to. They don't have enough leaf area. You know, when we get hot, we sweat, evaporation cools us down. Trees are doing that too. When they transpire, water's evaporating out of the leaves. That's cooling them down. 
now you've got this tree with very little leaf area and you're getting full sun on the stem and the canopy and yeah, I mean, you can just cook them. So, um, so at extremely high densities, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 trees per acre, you can't leave them like this for too long or you may just have to restart your, your whole rotation. Um, here's an example from out in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, this was uh, Oregon where we were looking at this scenario. But they had mixed conifer stands, so they had a lot of natural regeneration of Doug fir, Alaska cedar, and western hemlock. Um, but they were also planting some of those species. They were planting Doug fir, Sitka spruce, so lots of different valuable conifers out there. Um, this was an area where when you, when you went up on the ridges, you could actually see the Pacific Ocean, you know, five to ten miles away. Um, and their objective here was just commercial timber management. And so they had no pulpwood market. And so what they would do is they would almost always pre-commercially thin these stands because they would have planted the 600 or so trees per acre they wanted, but then they would end up with thousands of uh, seedlings coming in through natural regeneration. So they would send crews out with brush saws. I'll show you a picture in a minute, but it's you know basically a circular saw blade on the end of a weed whacker is what it looks like. Um, and they would go through there and they would cut it down to the right density. But this looked like just an absolutely miserable job. These stands were super thick, lots of sword fern in there too. And so you just had to push your way through there. There was no open space at all. So they would pre-commercially thin them and then they would come back in 35 or 40 years and clear cut them. So they, they really didn't do any commercial thinning at all. So they had to get them down to those lower densities uh, pretty early on. Um, this was actually an example where they had a contractor out there they were working with. These stands are so thick, so it's really hard to supervise these crews, and it's difficult to go out in these stands and see how many trees per acre exactly they're leaving. So what they were doing is they were flying it with a drone. Um, they were getting an ortho photo mosaic, and they had software they would run it through where it would pinpoint individual tree crowns. And from that, you know, they would have a point in the middle of each one, they could tally up points per land area in GIS, and they could do that one day. This pre-commercial thinning might take a week or two, depending on the acreage of the stand. So they could do that on day one, day two, and they could come out and they could show the crew a map, and they could say, you're hitting this too heavy, you hit over here too light, and then the crew can figure out, well, we sent you over here, we sent you over here, cut more trees, cut less trees, and they can you know, more efficiently and more accurately um, thin to the prescription so they can adjust what they're doing. Okay, so as we get into these definitions of pre-commercial thin, we need to look at our definitions of tree size. And I can't remember if it was this section or the other section, uh, but I think one of y'all got a question on what a pole was. Um, so in a tree size context, pole has nothing to do with utility poles. Um, it's a specific size class of tree. And so saplings, they're gonna be young trees, uh, size, all, all this varies regionally. And it varies regionally because you have different species, you have different markets. Markets dictate this a lot. Um, but seedling is just a small tree. Sapling is a small tree. Um, pole is between sapling size and mature tree. And so here are some size classes we can use in the U.S. South. We don't hear the term pole used very often in the South. Um, because in the South, if you look at that pole size class, what, what is that size class? So for pine, four to eight inches? DBH, what's a four to eight inch DBH tree in the south? That's pulpwood. We have a market for it. So you typically hear this term pole used in parts of the country that don't have a pulpwood market. So when they say pole, they're thinking this tree could become good saw timber, but right now it's worthless. Um, but around here, we don't hear pole used because we call them pulpwood trees. And so there you've got a seedling less than about two inches in DBH, a sapling two to four inches DBH, pole four to eight or four to 12, depending on whether it's pine or hardwood, and then saw timber is that larger size class. Um, when you get into ecology and you're doing different ecological studies, you may you know, change your definition between seedling and sapling there. Um, it'll depend on specifically what you're trying to do. But these are size classes you typically would think of in pre-commercial thinning. And so here we've got three different types of pre-commercial thinning that all have very similar definitions and can be confusing. Um, so they'll all start with a release treatment. So we're trying to release growing trees. You hear that term release treatment used with herbicides a lot. So we have two categories of herbicide application. You can do a site prep application of herbicide where you spray before your trees are out there, your crop trees are planted, and then you can do a release application, which means you're spraying over the top. 
but you can do a release mechanically as well. And so here you see uh, a guy with a machete out there uh, cutting down longleaf pines by hand. And so all these definitions start with a release treatment made, made it in an age class not past the sapling stage, okay? So we're not even cutting pulpwood, this is pre-commercial. So we're cutting, you know, trees less than four inches DBH. And here, the bottom part there is what's gonna vary with each of these three definitions. So we're, we're cutting those same saplings in a release treatment, but we're doing it to free up different trees. So here you're freeing up favored trees from less desirable individuals of the same age class that are overtopping them are likely to do so. So you have an even age stand, all the trees are about the same time. You go and you cut out the undesirable ones. That would be a cleaning. Here's a liberating operation. So the definitions all start the same. A release treatment made in a stand, not past the sapling stage. But here with a liberating, what you're doing is you're liberating these seedlings and saplings from older overtopping trees, from older overtopping trees. Um, have we done any or talked about any treatments so far that sound like this definition? Can you think of anything you may have written on a prescription that sounds like you're doing this? Yeah, so if you remove the overwood and a shelter wood or you remove the seed trees in a seed tree system, it sounds very much like this pre-commercial operation. Um, but it's not, right? That was a regeneration method. This is an intermediate treatment. And because this is an intermediate treatment and a pre-commercial thin, we know those overtopping trees we're removing aren't going on a long trip, right? If you do your seed tree and your shelter wood right, hopefully you're able to capture the value off those trees when you remove them. Because remember, they're gonna put on really good growth after you do the first cut in those systems. And so you're hopefully putting those on a log truck so that they can't be a pre-commercial thing, right? You're removing timber. But here, you're releasing them from some overtop trees that were left out there, maybe from the previous rotation, right? They're older. Um, and so, you know, you're not pulling commercial trees that are older than them and overtop. So how might you remove that? What would be the easiest way to remove that big overtopping tree? Yeah, I mean, you could cut it down, but you know, what's even less labor and safer for you? So girdling would have been old school. So girdling is you cut the phloem, the cambium, all the way around. But honestly, trees will bridge right over that and keep growing. And when you girdle them, it takes them years to die. It's just slowly starving them. Hack and squirt, right? Hack and squirt is the model, modern version of girdling where you can use that herbicide to kill the roots quickly, the top quickly. And so hack and squirt can be effective in one year. Girdling will usually take several years to kill the tree. And I, I've literally seen, uh, it was a study up in Minnesota where they were girdling, I think it was black ash. They were trying to remove ash from a stand to see what would happen when the emerald ash borer got there and see how their stands grew without black ash. And so they had these, you know, maybe four to eight inch DBH black ash and they had girdled them. They, they had removed everything on like four inches vertically. So they had this four inch swath around it and the tree had just grown this bridge of phloem and cambium right over the top of that and it was still alive. So they'd even girdled it twice. So girdling's not nearly as effective um, as hack and squirt is gonna be. So yeah, go out there and hack and squirt that tree. It's safe for the operator because you don't have big heavy trees falling um, and then they'll die and they'll dry out in the air and they'll fall down gradually over a period of years. So. Okay, um, our last option is weeding. So again, release treatment and stands not past the sapling stage. And here you're eliminating um, suppressed undesirable vegetation regardless of crown position. So the first two definitions, you're removing overtopping trees. That's a crown position. Okay, here you're removing trees in the same age class. So, you know, you're kind of looking at a lot of co-dominant crowns here, right? But the definition of weeding is crown position doesn't matter. Just cut them on a spacing or something like that. Leave me one good tree every 10 feet by 10 feet. Um, and that, that would be what you call weeding. And here's an example of that brush saw I was telling you about where you've got a couple handles on it and a harness so it's safer and easier to use. But he's just got a circular saw blade at the end of that stick there. So, so that's a weed. Our final type of pre-commercial thin has a little bit of a different definition. A timber stand improvement is a cutting made in a stand pole size or larger. So you have trees that here in the South could be of a commercial size, but they may be species that aren't merchantable. If you have to go cut out a bunch of hop hornbeam and hornbeam to improve a stand, a bunch of mulberry, you know, you're not selling those trees, right? So 
Um, and so you may be improving the composition and quality, um, but you still don't have anything virtual. So you could accomplish this with hack and squirt. You could accomplish this with a hand felling crew or with big equipment. Um, so that's a timber stand for me. Often we will hear this abbreviated as a TSI. So there are two contexts in which you'll hear the term timber stand improvement or TSI used. This is the narrow specific silvicultural definition that only applies to a type of pre-commercial thinning. Okay, so this is a very narrow application of TSI. A lot of the forest products companies, you may have seen this on FRC's prescriptions that you did at Field Station. A, a lot of folks will use the term TSI to mean any pre-commercial treatment you do on a stand early in the rotation. So they'll call early fertilizer application an herbicide release, any kind of early investment you're making on that stand that's not yielding an immediate economic return, they'll call those TSIs. And so there's this really broad definition that can include a bunch of different types of treatments. So if you hear people talking about TSIs, that's what the abbreviation stands for. And then just keep in mind, it could be this really narrow pre-commercial thinning definition, or it could be just a broader, we're doing something near establishment and we're spending money on it and not yielding an immediate economic return. Yeah, Sally. The fish and game guy in Arkansas calls them wildlife stand improvements. Is that WSIs, a, is yeah. Is that a standard term for like the wildlife industry or is he trying to trick the public? My guess is that's a term you hear the federal and state agencies uh, using. I, I haven't honestly heard that term a lot, um, but um, it, if, if you see that term, it's not really telling you what they're doing. It's telling you their landowner objective with the treatment, right? Um, so that's more a landowner objective than it is a specific treatment. Um, if you hear DFCs or DSCs, those are desired forest conditions or desired stand conditions, so you could use the term desired forest condition, just you're the landowner, tell me what you want out of the forest, that's your desired forest condition. You could use it in a very broad sense, but those terms have also been specifically used by a group of state and federal wildlife management agencies to describe a suite of treatments. And you know they, they didn't get as much into the silviculture, they kind of made up their own terminology as they went. But what they came up with is basically um, group selection uh, in terms of a regen method. And I think you saw some examples up in Arkansas on the first day. And then they, they've come up with thinning, but you don't thin uniformly throughout the stand. Um, so when you thin, you leave some areas pretty dense, you leave other areas at lower rates of increase. So, and what they're doing with those is the objective is to move from more homogeneous, even-aged forests to more heterogeneous, uneven-aged forests. And it honestly, it, it came out of um, neotropical migrant songbird management. Uh, but managing for habitat for birds, you know, you basically just try to make a bunch of diversity because it's for a bunch of different species. And then the thought is that'll benefit everything else. So if, if you build it, they will come is sort of the concept there. Okay, so any questions on pre-commercial thinning? So pre-commercial thinning is important. You don't want to have to pre-commercially thin, right? Because you're spending money doing this and you're not yielding an immediate return. But if you have to pre-commercially thin, it may be one of the most valuable treatments you do on that rotation. It may prevent total stand loss and it may cut years off your rotation by accelerating stand development. So, Okay, next up we have commercial thinning. Um, and so when we look at commercial thinning, uh, we really see kind of two of these applied in plantation settings. Um, we've got one of them that flat out doesn't work in the south and we've already talked about it briefly. And then we've got, you know, one or two of these that you could see applied pretty well in hardwood management. Um, in the south. And so as we look at low thinning, cut trees in lower crown classes to grow trees in upper crown classes. Um, so I threw in an example, here's Colorado high elevation Engelman spruce, um, just to, you know, kind of give us a different perspective again, uh, because, you know, again, we get used to 25 year rotations, quick turnaround on pine. Look at the data at the bottom there, they thinned it at age 41. And before the thinning, it had 100 square feet per acre of basal area, 500 trees per acre, and an average diameter of six inches. So, <laughs> you know, that's a 40-year-old Engelman spruce stand. That would be a 10-year-old pine plantation, right, um, in the south. So we've got to keep in mind different growth rates in different parts of the country. So removing little trees to grow big trees doesn't make intuitive sense, right? If you have an even-aged pure stand and they're intolerant of shade, those little trees are just gonna die anyway, right? Um, those are gonna be the lower crown classes, they're gonna get suppressed, they're gonna die off. And so what are you doing? Um, you're really trying to accelerate stand development. 
you're not providing more light to the larger trees. Those smaller trees usually aren't competing for light, but you're basically fertilizing and irrigating the stand. You're providing the more below ground resources is what you're doing. And so um, this is where, what, we've got maybe 10 lectures left after this, uh, but we're gonna see this heavily next week. Uh, silviculturists are lazy. If, if we have a list of something, we always label them A, B, C, D, E. And so we're gonna get into A, B, C, D, E grades of low thinning. We're gonna get into A, B, and C level stocking. Um, we're gonna get into A, B, and C lines on a stocking guide. Um, we're gonna go over A, B, C, D, and E types of growth responses when we get into forest nutrition. So we're gonna keep using these. So just, you know, as you start saying A, B, C, whatever, keep in mind what exactly you're talking about because we're using these same letters in a bunch of different contexts now. So this only applies to low thinning. It doesn't apply to other types of thinning, but you can remove more or less trees in a low thin. So grade A is only removing the suppressed trees. Grade B is removing all but the dominance and co-dominance. So you also remove the intermediate crown class trees. Grade C, you remove the dominance and many of the codominance as well as all the suppressed and all the intermediate trees. And then by the time you get up to grade E, you know, only the dominance are removed. Or sorry, all but the dominance are removed. Okay, so we don't have to do this as a group exercise, but if I wanna do a grade A low thin, which of those trees do I remove? And you can see they're just numbered left to right. So the numbers aren't diameters or anything like that. So what trees do I cut out if I wanna do a grade A low thin? you remove our suppressed trees. Okay, how much better is my stand growing now after that grade A low thin? How happy is the logger to have done that job? <laughs> we don't see grade A low thinning done very often because it just, you know, dinks at the stand just a little, but it's not worth the logger's time. The logger's not gonna wanna come out and do that job. Um, your stand's not gonna grow much better and you've run heavy equipment through the stand and you may have roughed up the trees you left. Okay, so now I want to do a grade B thin. So what, what trees do I move in a, remove in addition to 5, 8, and 13? Yeah, 3, 10, 15. I take out my intermediate trees. One as well there, okay? So now I've removed them. So we can see the trees that are left. Is, is that causing a major growth response? It's a little better. It's still not ideal. Okay, so now a grade C low thin. We remove all the intermediates, we remove all the suppressed, which we've already done, and then you leave all the dominance, but you remove some of the codominance. So what might we take out in a grade C low thin? Yeah, so you could remove six and 12, or you could remove seven and 11, right? So there's six and 12 gone. Okay, so look at what's removed, look at what's left. Am I getting a decent growth response there? Probably. Are the loggers happy? Were they willing to come out and do that job? Probably. This is gonna be our most common grade of low thinning in the South. And this is what we're really gonna be discussing uh, when we get into the quantitative tools next week. So all the examples we'll use are gonna be a grade C low thin. And so we've been using basal area targets. You know, your stand's 130 square feet per acre, cut it down to 75 square feet per acre. We've been describing thinning in terms of basal area, but from a crown class perspective, this is what those basal area removals would have approximately accomplished, okay? And then grade D low thinning, you go pretty heavily into the codominance. And so, you know, that may be, not be the best diagram of it, but you start seeing where you're removing pretty heavily, you may start getting nervous that you're wasting growing space. And then a grade E low thin, all you leave is, you know, some of the, the dominance. So, um, and most of your stands probably don't have that many dominance out in them, right? Uh, but as we look at that, you know, what's that starting to look like? It starts looking like a seed tree or a shelter wood, right? And so a grade E, you might get regeneration when, I mean, we know we're going to plant the next stand here maybe. So you don't want a bunch of seedlings on the ground. You don't want to waste that growing space between trees four and nine. So that may be too heavy. So it's, it's the Goldilocks philosophy where here grade C is that sweet spot right in the middle. Okay, so any questions on low thing? Low thinning is usually pretty straightforward. You all are usually pretty, you know, comfortable with low thinning. Um, would you want to go out and low thin a, a hardwood stand that has 30 different species in it? That may not work as well, right? Um, so we already had our uh, tree classification lab where you went out and used all those different criteria, including crown classification to decide which trees to cut and which trees to leave. 
that application that we did probably most closely fits crown thinning, um, which is th thought of as thinning from above. Keep in mind, as we go over crown thinning and selection thinning here, those are the two thinning terms that you all most commonly confuse with each other. And so thinning from above, you remove big trees to grow other big trees. So it's not the opposite of low thinning. Low thinning was removing little trees to grow big trees. Okay, so crown thinning is not removing big trees to grow little trees. It's removing big trees to grow the other big trees. So one application of crown thinning might be go out into this cherry bark oak stand, look at the crown on that cherry bark oak tree you wanna uh, manage and say, I'm gonna open it up on two sides. So I'm gonna take out that crappy tree there and that crappy tree here, and that's gonna free up the crown on two sides. That's gonna give me release on that future crop tree. So you take out big trees, dominance and co-dominance, but you do it to grow your other dominance and co-dominance. You're not doing it to grow smaller trees in that stand. Okay, so one application of crown thinning would be that tree classification Putnam-based system that we used in lab. Um, you also hear folks talk about crop tree management as a type of thinning sometime. That's gonna be an application of crown thinning. And the idea there is you go and you pick your best 10 to 50 crop trees per acre, depending on the quality of the stand, and then grow them. So cut the trees around them. Okay, so you're cutting the big trees around them to open them up. And what we find in regions like the central hardwood region, southern Indiana, Kentucky, southern Appalachian region, so Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, those sort of areas, when they do this in hardwoods, you basically will grow the trees you leave an extra inch a decade. But if that tree you're growing an extra inch a decade is a white oak, a northern red oak, um, around here a cherry bark oak, that can be very high value wood uh, that you're growing. Okay, um, so is this going to be an early thin that you do? Is this going to be necessarily your first thin in a stand? Can you do this when the trees are small and haven't differentiated crowns much? Probably not. So this is a thin you need to do once the trees are well into stem exclusion. Uh, you, you can't really jump the gun on this. And then when you do this operation, how should you do it? You know, what are you going to be looking for in a logger that you're hiring to do this job? Are you marking this or are you letting the logger pick the trees? You're going to mark this. And what are you worried about with the logger doing this operation where you've picked your best 10 to 50 trees per acre? What are you worried about? Yeah, so you worry about high grading. If they cut to what you marked, hopefully you've covered that. You worry about them damaging those 10 to 50 trees per acre, right? So you want a logger that's really good with the feller um, so that they can drop those trees without, you know, dinging up your, your future crop trees. Okay, any questions on crown thinning, crop tree management? Okay, here is selection thinning. Selection thinning is the opposite of low thinning. And so I've already marked on a bunch of your prescriptions, you know, terminology, one with a circle, anytime you put selection thinning, because what you meant was operator select. The person in the feller chooses which trees are cut. Okay, that's operator select, and that, that's a good use of that term select. If you say operator select, but here's what a selection thinning is, and this is why I marked that on your prescriptions. Selection thinning is removing trees in the dominant crown class to favor the lower crown classes. This is the opposite of low thinning. Low thinning is cutting the small trees to grow the big trees. Selection thinning is cutting the big trees to grow the small trees. Think about every stand you've been in in Dendro. Think about every stand we went to week one and two in lab. There wasn't a single stand we've been to where you could cut the biggest trees, grow the smaller trees in them, and have that stand look good. Uh, regardless of whether your objective is wildlife, timber, recreation, those are not the forests we have here in the US South. Um, if you look at the useful handouts packet, there's a shade tolerance by timber value table in there towards the end. And what you'll notice is there's a trend where our lower timber value species are more intolerant of shade and our higher timber value species are more intolerant of shade. And so to do this, you're basically releasing shade tolerant species. But the shade tolerant species we have in the South, hornbeam, hop hornbeam, red mulberry, flowering dogwood, they're trees that will never make it to the overstory or trees that have no timber value, okay? Red maple. So they're not trees we wanna manage under almost any of our landowner objectives that we commonly have. 
And so selection thinning just never works. In the South, when you try this, it pretty much always leads to high grade, which is cutting the best and leaving the rest. And so that's gonna always reduce the quality of your stand, um, reduces the quality of the next stand, because if we do this around here, think about what we're removing. We're removing big pines to grow little suppressed pines that just aren't gonna be anything ever. We're removing oaks, hickories to grow maples, mulberries. And so you're removing the desirable seed sources out there for that next rotation. And so it really ends up not being ideal. And so selection thinning, cut the big trees to grow the little trees. Crown thinning, cut the big trees to grow the big trees. So we do have applications of crown thinning in the South. We don't really have applications of selection thinning. I've never seen a selection thin. You might have just a bizarre scenario where you've got just poorly formed dominant trees, fusiform rust, bad stem sinuosity, lots of forking. And for some reason, this was a two-age stand and you had a lower cohort that was young enough you could release and you just get lucky and it works. But we're probably realistically not gonna see this in the South. Um, where you would see this work is when you have areas where pulpwood is worth a lot. So if pulpwood's worth a lot, you can remove the larger trees to grow those pulpwood size classes, okay? Um, but, you know, here's projections of pulpwood prices in the south to 2040. So we're guessing they're not going to change. Um, they projected saw timber prices too. I'm not exactly sure how they projected a decline from 2020 to 2030 and then an increase back to 2040. But um, we, we don't think pulpwood's going to be worth much anytime in the foreseeable future, so. Probably no application of selection thinning in the South, so. Okay, so any questions on selection thinning? Study that definition, because if I put that on a quiz, usually most of the class misses it, so study that definition. Okay, geometric thinning is going to be more straightforward. Uh, the only challenge with geometric thinning is we have a few different terms to describe it. Geometric thinning, mechanical thinning, row thinning, corridor thinning, we've got a lot of different terms. Um, so mechanical thinning is confusing because we're using machinery to do all of these. But this was called mechanical thinning back when you might use machinery for this and then you might use chainsaws or hand felling crews for the other operations. So kind of a historical relic, but you know, if you hear mechanical thinning, that's a synonym for geometric thinning. That's not a synonym for doing any of the other types of thins with machinery. So that, that can be a little bit confusing, but pretty straightforward. Pick a geometric pattern and go cut it into the stand. That's all it is. You could go do a geometric thin where it was triangles, circles, you know, a fancy crop circle pattern, but you never see that done because that would be operationally inefficient. The operationally efficient thing in a pine plantation is go cut down every third row. So it's a row thin. The operationally efficient thing in a naturally regenerated stand is go bulldoze a 10 foot wide corridor, go 40 feet over and do it again. And so it's a corridor thing. So you don't have rows, so you can't row thin. But that, that's all a geometric thin is. So here's them doing it by hand in Poplar in Idaho with a chainsaw, and, and that's a second row thin. So, you know, there's a weird application we wouldn't see around here. Often we'll do fifth row thins in Loblaw Pine. So third, fourth, fifth row may all be common. Um, you usually don't see people going wider than fifth row. Uh, Mr. Grogan will get really excited about his experiment with seventh row thinning, but um, the challenge with going wider, you're cutting those rows in because you need access to the stand. Your equipment can't fit between the rows. And you also want to cut down trees in the rows you're leaving up usually. And so if you go wider than fifth row, you just don't have access. If you go fifth row, then your equipment only has to get two rows in on this side, two rows in on the other side, and it can cut trees in those rows that it's leaving up. The other thing that we tend to see around here with our typical spacings, if you do a fifth row thin, and then you need to do uh, intermediate treatment and herbicide application, you can send a skitter down your down rows to spray herbicide. And if you do a fifth row thin, it'll about meet right in the middle. So you'll get pretty good coverage of the herbicide. If you go on a tighter spacing, you would often be over spraying uh, with a skitter based herbicide application. Yeah, Hunter. Yeah, so row thinning and corridor thinning would both be subcategories of geometric thinning. There's specific types of geometric thinning. 
And then mechanical thinning and geometric thinning are synonymous for this category. But I think it makes more sense for us to call it geometric thinning when we talk about the category, because mechanical thinning gets confusing. But so when you're describing a row thin, you're talking about a specific application of a geometric thinning. Yeah. Technically, a what I'm describing where you would row thin it and then you cut the trees in between the rows, you know, that may not strictly be a geometric thin, right? Because it's not doing it now just by spacing, because you're making some decisions on what trees you cut in the rows that you've left up. So um, it may blend and I'll show you that with free thinning in a moment. But um, so when we use row thinning, it has to be in a plantation. Otherwise, your trees are not in rows. So that's an easy mistake to make. Um, but how many rows depends on your operations. It depends on your initial planting spacing. And we've already talked about examples where when you go to these more rectangular spacings, you don't need to go do this. And we've already talked about the logic. The logic around geometric thinning is very simple. Third row thinning, you cut a third of your trees. You cut a third of your best trees. You cut a third of your worst trees. You cut a third of your average trees. So. So it's not ideal in a high value stand because you cut down a certain percentage of your best trees. If you have a stand that you can move around in, that's laid into stem exclusion, and you can pick the winners and losers, do a crown thin, release the winners, okay? Um, even though it may be operationally more complex. If you think about that HGT plantation out there uh, where you guys were out there measuring your plots, could you really tell that tree's definitely a winner and that tree's definitely a loser? or were most of your trees about average. Early in the rotation, it's hard to necessarily pick the winners and losers. Sure, there were a few losers you could pick, those one, two inch diameter pines. Those aren't gonna make it, we know that. But if you have more than half your stand in the six and seven inch size classes, it's hard to tell which are the best and which are the worst. So a row thinning may not be that big of a deal. And again, we're talking pine saw timber here, so it's not gonna be as valuable necessarily as hardwood saw timber. But because you're cutting down your best trees early in the rotation, you don't want to do this later in the rotation. And because you're doing this to gain access, that down row is still there next time you come back to thin. It may have Yopon in it, but you can run Yopon over with your feller, okay? And so because that down row is still there, you don't row thin again. You don't row thin a second time. There's no reason to. So that's why almost all our second thins and plantations are going to be low thins. You already have the access. And now you can pick the winners and the losers, go cut down the losers, keep the winners to the end of the rotation. Our last category of commercial thinning is free thinning. And um, a, a lot of silviculture professors don't really like this term. Um, and they don't like it because it could kind of be anything. So removal of trees to control spacing and favor desired trees using a combination of thinning criteria without regard to crown position. So that could be almost anything. So if it doesn't clearly fit into low thin, selection thin, crown thin, geometric thin, if it doesn't fit one of those other four, it's probably a free thin. That's sort of our catch all category. Or there's the example of what I've been telling you about where you row thin it, but you also low thin the areas in between. That's kind of combining two thinning methods. You could call that free thinning technically, right? Because, um, you know, it's combining a couple methods. But if something doesn't strictly fit one of the above definitions, call it a free thin. It's our catch-all category. And so now you can think about different thinning schedules and we'll get into the tools to do that next week. But, you know, do you need a pre-commercial thin? Do you need a commercial thin? You know, there's pros and cons to both. With those pre-commercial thins, it may be the best treatment you can do on that stand. You may have to do it. You may really need to do it. You don't want to do it because you're spending money. If you could wait to the point it's commercial, the landowner can make money on the thin rather than losing money. So. Lots of different pros and cons between them and lots of different things you need to think about to schedule your things out. So any questions on thinning?